Uh, all right, let's get started with our 12th Think Big for the Release Management Group. Uh, Nathan, you have the first topic, which is about the release pages use cases. Do you want to voice over what you have? Um, yeah, uh, this came from a, a meeting a while back. I think you mentioned that one of the use cases that we want to support is um, kind of like a maybe a company that's deploying a SaaS application. And every time they deploy, they want to mark a release or record a release on the releases page. Um, and in my head that I'd never really considered that use case. And that almost seems, it seems very different than the other use case, which is like um, communicating to users that your software is ready to be consumed, like GitLab, for example, like 13.0 is, is ready to use. Um, is that first use case, is that something that were, is that a, a correct use case or is that, am I off about that? So I would say I've seen customers leverage releases in other products like GitHub, for example, to track the state of a production deployment, but also they attach things like assets and other objects or binaries to that release object to be downloaded by other people. So it really is like a snapshot of what would be a production environment for somebody else to consume. So that's definitely a valid use case. When we go up against tools like Xevia Labs or Plutora, there's an expectation in the deployment space that there's a way to trace the current state of their production code or the version that's in production while they have another work in progress version. This way they can have um, like production SaaS code that's live on a mobile device might lag behind the web application. So they would want to be able to display on the page that the web application has this version and the mobile has this version of the code. Uh, that is that notification, that display, that consumption of their production environment is a very common use case that we're seeing with people who are deploying SaaS applications with GitLab. Okay. I'm wondering if that, that almost sounds like a better fit for the environments page. Um, like we should be building that into the environments because that's really what that page is about is about what's like what's live. So I'm wondering if if we shouldn't be if we should almost be discouraging the releases page for that purpose. So that's why I added my second bullet point. Um, my first bullet point here, third bullet point in the list um, about environment overview and problems that customers are looking to solve because you started jogging like some of the things that we're digging into with the environments page today uh, at scale customers are unable to wrangle the environments. There isn't really a great way to consume that. And they end up having to navigate from the environment uh, page or, v or list into the pipeline for the deployment to see their production state. Um, and if we look at a company that has 1300 developers pushing to that production environment multiple times a day, it would be virtually impossible to see what is the state of their production code. So that's why they're leveraging the release object as a container for all of these changes, that this is a representative um, production state with this attached binary that we compiled in a Docker and is now living in, 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 in a different environment somewhere else, right? So that's, I agree that we should eventually discourage customers from showing um, their production state on the releases page, but only if we can support tracking hundreds of thousands of environments on the environments page, because today that's virtually impossible. Oh, cool. Okay. okay. So, and, and under that scenario, if we somehow, you know, change the environments page or probably turn it into a dashboard or something, would we have a link between the environment and the release on that page? So in our epics that Hai and I are working on right now, we're grouping together all of the features and the 
redesign issues and the environment's dashboard problems and validating with customers, like how are they using these things today? Is that even the right thing that they're doing? Um, and what I found is that the environments are representative of a deployment, meaning this is something that is live, whether that's in a testing state or in a production state. And customers are very interested in all the contributions to those states and perspectives. So having a release tag on the environment could be misleading if developers mm -hmm. are tagging each of their changes to a master branch, for example, with a release tag. Um, mm -hmm. So it depends on if, mm -hmm. if we break the connection between tag and a release and people aren't auto-generating releases for every sort of production change, then I could see that being really usable. Otherwise, it really would just be uh, currently what we have is the commit back to that, that last yeah. run, last, sure. that last yeah. run pipeline. Yeah. So it depends on what, what's the utility of having that release tag okay. on it. Okay. But I could see a use case for the customers that are, uh, for example, using GitLab for inner sourcing or embedded software, where the release tag is the last commit about pushing all of these changes to a particular location or environment. And it's like, a, it's, um, it's almost like representative of the final production deployment. That would be a, a, a a use case where they would want to see the release tag on the environment, but sometimes that's not do, always the use case. Do, do, do we have, I, I actually, I'm not, do we have a link at present between the environment and the commit? That yes. made the environment? We do, okay. Yeah. Or not the one that made the environment, since you can make an environment in the front end and then reference that in your YAML file, but there is a commit link to the pipeline that's being run for the job on that environment. Okay. I think so. Either. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. It seems, yeah, there's, I can imagine a lot of cool ways to kind of tie the two together. Like you could almost, if we, somehow could associate the two like in a say this release is running in this environment um like on the releases page we could show currently and deployed to right. or you could even do things like somehow like drag and drop a release onto an uh, environment or something like crazy that. like that That's, that sounds great yeah, yeah. and that would that really would help. be that'd be require a fundamental redesign i think but <laughs> that'd be kind of cool I think showing um, showing the uh, quick MVC would be connecting the the last um, environment for that release. So, for example, if we have an upcoming release, and th this would require us to have the fracture between tag and release because we would have an upcoming release without a tag. And if they were to do a commit. It could show this is now on the review app stage, and that could be like a whole approval workflow that we could build out for, for customers who are wanting people to approve a review app prior to a deployment to production. So there's that whole like governance use case that we could support with this idea of, um, of connecting an environment to a release bundle. Nice, cool. Okay, that, that makes me feel better that I wasn't completely misunderstanding our the purpose for release is paid. No, you're not, not at all. It is, it's, it's challenging though, because we're seeing that customers are merging several of the tools that used to be in their toolkit in certain, and they're kind of shoehorning certain functionality for their use case. So like releases are not only being used to distribute binaries as asset links, but they're being used to snapshot their production code. They're being used to, create that traceability between an issue and, an, um, and the release via the connection with milestones. Uh, so eventually we'll have to see where things like release evidence takes us. 
because release evidence is something that's showing a change from a release tag and it's supposed to contain the artifacts as a snapshot of the, the deployment of the change that's been made of the release rather. Um, and customers are going to use that as evidence to an auditor for what what's changed in their environment or in their production state. So that's like the eventually we'll be merging sort of those two points of release deployment and environment in that sort of um, context. Yeah, that's actually, you mentioned like the auditing. So is that kind of where release evidence comes from is um, they want to know the difference. I haven't worked with that feature much. So I don't have a great, great understanding of it, but is that just to understand in a deployed environment, what's changed between the two? Exactly. So that they're able to compare what, what, what is one version to, to the other version and kind of like diff them. So with that, in that case, would that make more sense in the context of the environments page to say what's, what's actually been deployed between these two versus I think the releases page? That'll make people who are using um, like deploy boards and Kubernetes clusters and uh, multiple environments for blue green deployments and advanced deployments really challenging. Um, I think that that was one thing that Ori started going down the road of, of where should release evidence live. And this is where if we have a release tag associated with a particular job that that kind of refines the point of which you're wanting evidence to be captured. Otherwise we could have like millions of evidences captured for each deployment to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so we yeah. kind of have to think through the select the selection of a release tag and why release evidence is being captured there. Is the tag the target audience for release evidence is is some type of auditor or internal compliance group, right? Yeah. yeah. Or people who are um, trying to enforce like SOX compliance, mm -hmm. um, regulatory bodies that are mm -hmm. outside of the development. Cool. I think I have the next point too, if, unless there's more discussion on that one. No, oh, I was just leaving some space in case anyone else had other questions. <laughs> yep, let's do it. Let's go for the next one. Um, this one, as I typed it out, I think I, I kind of clarified it myself, but um, we have, right now we have, we're adding a lot of links so different types of links. Um, and I, I'm just trying to think through, we kind of have th um, things that could be directly associated with release or they could be release assets or we could have asset links. And now we have like different types of links. Um, I'm wondering if instead we should simplify it all just to assets um, and to say like, instead of having, um, Yeah, I guess I was trying to think through what, what should be an asset, and what should be an asset link. But then I, I realized these are all links that we're adding, they're like they're all URLs. So it, it does make sense that they're links. Um, I think and then eventually if we have like an internal connection, maybe that's when it's no longer a, a link and it's rather just an asset. Um, yeah, so I think when we extend the release CLI to be able to actually upload objects to a release, um, and store those in a package, a generic package registry. Um, we support this idea of an actual asset being affixed and stored on a release. Today, we don't have storage on a release. So we're relying on this concept of an asset link to represent that this is something that's attached to the release, but we don't have storage for it. So it's a way that it's like a, it's almost like a hack that we're trying to yeah bridge and avoid the overhead of creating storage by leveraging um, this, this link. So I would say once we actually enable this storage on of assets, um, I, would, I, I would imagine asset links will probably go away. Uh, like people will start just uploading things directly to a release object. 
Um, but we would support asset links forever because there's probably other objects they're wanting to link. For example, they may cross link releases in different groups. Um, so they'd be like, here is an asset link from one release to another release, kind of going back to my mobile app deployment where it's a lagging um, version to a web app. Uh, so that's something to, to be mindful of is I think this is kind of something that we are, we are proliferating and we're supporting because we have this technical decision that we had to make with how we're going to support actual appendant, appending of an asset to a release. But you're and totally can I, right. <laughs> can I also just add something to that, um, looking at from a slightly different perspective? So um, just to so yeah, so assets, source code, so they're, they're actually, they're a link, but you know, they're generated from, from the commit. Right. So, so yes, we are storing them, but we're storing them in our Git repository, right? And then with the other four that we've just kind of added, you know, today, the asset links, um, you know, so the, so they're, I, I kind of see them as they're arbitrary things that get added to, like we always have the source code, right? And it's always more or less the same, right? Except for the, the code changes. But these, these other links, they could kind of be anything, you know, and they could be arbitrary and, um, they could differ between different releases. The, the only thing I didn't kind of get in your, um, in your little paragraph there, Nathan, was um, the direct links, the milestones. Could, how do we, I, I didn't kind of get how they fitted in with the other, the other things. Um, I was just thinking about how we, more just how we associate releases with other things. So one is like a link, for example, to a package. But milestones is an example. We don't just have a link to an, a milestone. We actually have like a kind of a first class relationship, relationship with a milestone. <laughs> yeah. So like if okay. someday if we do that with packages, you know, we could actually build a UI that kind of knows about a package and presents it a little better. So um, that was kind of the why I was tying okay, that in. Sure. I, I guess I guess what would be different about packages is you know like it is a thing. It's a well, it's a binary thing that sits in this other part of GitLab, but it's still, you know, it's a separate part of the package registry and yeah. I'm looking forward to doing that stuff. It's totally cool, I think. Um, yeah. Amazing what we're doing. Jack, you do one have... Last... No, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, one, one last question. What, to our customers, what value are the links providing given that they could just put that in the release notes and put those links in there and kind of label them themselves? Yeah, so updating a release note from um, a user that's in, I think, exclusively in the CLI was something that they just weren't, that it was a behavior that they weren't doing. So they were just, it, they were curling their release API and found it easier to append an asset link than to create a release note as a string. And we have a we have a um, an issue coming up where we're actually it's the opposite where we're creating the release notes from you know what's what's already there. I think I think Chris is working on that one. Like the change um, log is that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, the change log. Yeah, change yeah, log. The auto yeah. change log, which will be from like Git annotations. But will it also include the assets? The auto change log. Yeah, um, not necessarily. I don't. I think the MVC for that is just populating the release notes box with Git tag annotations as like a summary. Okay. Okay. Sure. And then as we iterate, it'll be, you know, links to the MRs that are relevant in the release. Yeah. Um, they started to like look at how the delivery team is doing the change log today, and it currently is like a an aggregation from this section on the MR for the, for each of your developers where you have like a, you know, your, your title and then the MR link and a, a brief description and that's aggregated and batched and then scripted into the release notes um, in their, in their own job. And what we'd want to do is build that kind of functionality inside of GitLab. But we realize like inside our product, but we realize that a lot of customers, aren't necessarily leveraging that sort of 
um, functionality where they have like a markdown file that's describing this MR, but instead they, you're, they're using um, message, commit messages to indicate that this change, what this change is. Um, so giving customers the flexibility to append that kind of information to their release object is broader, is a broader use case than what we're doing. Um, but okay. as far as looking at, um, you know, you asked a question before that I trying to remember what, what I had a response to before we went down this change log rabbit hole. Dang it. Should have written it down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Wild, but... No, you didn't derail it. That was a good, a good discussion. Um, like what, what, oh, what, 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 yeah, creating the release, creating what, the, yeah. what value is release links providing versus updating yeah. the release notes. Yeah. So today people are using releases in some cases as a container for production's current state. So we have three users I've talked to directly about embedded software. So they're linking their binaries to that release and then publishing that release to their internal customers to download and then deploy to a radio, to an RV, to uh, a different, you know, um, smart mm -hmm. machine. So in that use case, asset links are super fundamental because that is the declared version that people are allowed to then download into all of these other machines and hardware. Uh, for inner sourcing, people have images that they are setting up for all of their developers to use, and they have different security patches on it. They have improvements that they're making from their infrastructure as code use case, and they publish that each month for or each quarter for developers to then pull down and use as their uh, duplication for like testing environments, for example. So it has all the seed data in it. It has all of the, the relevant information for developers to locally test uh, code that they're deploying. So that's the second use case that I've seen releases be used for. It's kind of like the declaration that this is stuff you can consume and asset links are then linking to Artifactory or linking to another container registry. Does that make sense? So the, yeah, I think so. Because the alternative would be if you put it right in the markdown, your process that would pull these things would have to actually go parse your release notes. Exactly. And so that's just making it more machine readable. Right. And it's, it's, it's scripted, you know, like sometimes all of this is a script that is kicking off a series of uh, curls to the release API. It's not, not a, um, not a string that someone's manually coding. Right. Okay, it's an, cool. It's like an IAM role, I think is how I, how that they have, they have like a, a, a machine role that then kicks off once that last image is published. Cool. Okay. That gives me some good context. Yeah. Okay. I think we have 10 minutes left. Um, anything else on the assets and asset links? I know that Sean, we're working on this right now. So is there anything else that we would want to discuss or review? Yeah, just because <laughs> we, we went around a couple of times. It, I was, um, so I wasn't sure whether we had all four asset uh, link types. I, and so I caught, so I, as I put in the, in the notes, I called it, I started with type, but in fact, I had a, had a few problems with the word type. So I, I switched to the type. But um, yeah, so I added all four initially. Um, and, and so I guess the only thing to really discuss is this, this concept of, um, you know, the heuristics of trying to determine what the link is. Um, and I think we've more or less decided that we will, we will do this going forward, right? And I, I, I mentioned the place to do that would actually be the UI as you enter the, as you put in the link. Um, the only thing is in the current UI, you know, you first choose the, um, the link type and then you go down and you, you know, and so that, so that would be, you know, maybe you would leave it or default it or, and then when you change the link, it would then change that other drop down, right? I'm just wondering if that's, if we, you know, what you've got. Yeah. To that. It'd be a little weird if you first change the type and then paste something and then it flips it. 
to exactly. something else. Yeah. It'd be annoying. The, the type dropdown is later in the form. So I think most people would probably kind of fill it out sequentially, but yes, that would totally be a risk. Or we, I mean, we could get really fancy and say only automatically flip the type if you haven't already touched it. But at that point in time, oh, yeah. Yeah. I know we have to think about how much functionality to build into this dropdown. Yeah. I mean, all of those things, I mean, there's zero to do on the back end, you know, because it would just be whatever, whatever it gets selected gets posted and that's it. So this is more just like, how are we expecting users to interface with assigning a link type going forward if we do have heuristics? Okay. So let's say when we, when we talked with um, our customers and we reviewed the release prototypes, there was two internal ones and three external ones. When they were looking at assets and adding links, one of the things they did call out was being able to organize and bucket these, these links so that people knew what they were, not just this long string of this with an external source parentheses, right? So I think the problem of being able to improve the discoverability of the things that are linked to a release will be solved by the drop down menu. Now, whether or not people are have like a pre populated option, whether that's already other and then they have to manually reassign it for historical releases, I think that that's that's acceptable. But going forward, it would be really crummy for them to be in the UI and be creating their asset link, save it, and then they have their drop down menu selected, but it pre populates something else. So mm. I would say that is there is there a way to avoid that workflow? Like <laughs> I'm adding an NPM package and I actually selected package, but then for some reason that particular link didn't recognize the package URL that I selected and then it pre populated mm -hmm. other. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah. Which yeah. And I think also in the future, we have some issues about like allowing drag and drop and allowing other ways to add release assets. So now we're talking only about the links, right? right. Um, so people might, be want, might want to categorize those as well. So would the application be able to immediately recognize and label that differently in the interface? I think the, the drop down, um, yeah, is a low hanging fruit. <laughs> it's an easier way. Um, but I wonder if it will be more prone to errors if we could immediately recognize and then pre-select that and then force the user to fix that manually. Like that. Yeah, just restriction. So like I'm, I'm okay with our MVC going with as is and then following the bugs that come in with that and prioritizing those yeah. very, very quickly. I think it's low risk. It will be annoying, but I don't think it would prevent people from adding asset links and classifying asset links. Because um, I imagine that they create an asset link, say that they populate the, uh, the little drop down menu, they click save and then holy crap, holy cow, that's actually a package and it says it's other. I think that they would, the page would refresh, they'd go to the releases page, they would see that that is actually classified as other and then they'd click edit and they would select the drop down menu. So it would probably add, you know, like, four clicks to their journey of saving that release asset. But as long as we have in the documentation that you may need to manually reassign it after you create an asset link in the UI, um, then that's at a the, at, at the end of the day, it's documentation, right? I mean, yeah. sorry, it is that the, what, what the category is, is purely, it's, you know, we can guess what it should be, but it's basically pretty arbitrary. Right. When, when we when we use the package registry, will we will, we can probably then say this is a package. Yes, that's what I would hope because that kind of ties back to what Nathan was saying earlier. When we create relationships between things, having GitLab recognize that this is a relationship and link, like have context that this is stored in the package and therefore is a package. <laughs> and, and when we say image, are we are we do we mean Docker image? Uh, so in our think big with uh, 
the package team, they recognized their customers are recognizing there's a difference between a package and an image. So an image um, is yes, uh, like a Docker image, it's a particular yeah. build, whereas a package may be a collection of multiple builds. Because because if we you know extend the you know like if we um, use a package registry, oops, just lost my plug. If we use a package registry. Okay, we can say that's a package, and if we use our Docker can, uh, registry, we, we can say that's a, an image. Um, but it, I don't know. Maybe that's also just still a default. I'm I, I'm comfortable um, absorbing the the risk that we have with a, a, an irritation if the yeah. heuristic overrides what a user initially puts in during the API during the, um, the UI's entry. My thoughts though would be most people who are using asset links are generating them via machine. So I would imagine that they would assign a link type at that time. Mm -hmm. So the, we may be discussing a UI problem or interaction that might not actually address most of the people who are using asset links today anyways. Okay. Uh, kind of a related note, is this, would guessing the the type would that is it purely for the convenience of the user? Is that what would be um, the purpose of that? So I'm not sure. To be honest, like it's just one drop down. I'm not sure that it's worth doing a lot of heuristics to try to decide. It seems like a we're mm -hmm. not really saving that much time. Yeah, it might be. It would be nice um, if we were looking historically, right, for it to be like a data integrity thing. But we decided that there might be a lot of misclassifications. So that's likely not the best way to go. So their heuristic would be for the convenience of people as they add asset links. Because for example, say that they curl the API, add an asset link, they didn't update their script to include type. Auto recognizing type would allow them to render the benefit of having a type selection. If, if there, I mean, if there are, just thinking about the historic question, I mean, if it is a big pain point historically, I mean, it would be possible to script the API, right, and for a customer to, you know, to update that to whatever they wanted to. Yeah, self-managed customers are going to be the biggest pain point there because they'll be on, yeah. like, they'll have to upgrade. Many, many times they'll have to upgrade a version and then they'll have other issues that they'll run into. So yeah, any, anything yeah, the, with data seems pretty challenging. Exactly. Yeah. Any, I mean, we've seen this with production um, in data integrity issues like, okay, yes, we can look in GitLab.com and we can see what the problems are, you know, but when it comes to self-hosted, we have no visibility. And if we write a cleanup script, you know, it could have unforeseen consequences and, and that's just kind of running invisibly in the background during the upgrade. And yeah, I think it's good to be very cautious on that stuff. Yeah. So for this MVC, for the one that we're building out right now, I'm not convinced that a heuristic is completely necessary, Nathan, going back to your point. I don't know if the juice is worth a squeeze and if it's going to be a lot of um, complexity, then I would say we should forego it and just implement the type and have it default to other and then people opt in, you know? Um, and then if we find that users are like asking for this feature, we have the issue created. Um, we also have this idea of creating relationships between objects that are GitLab native. I think that that would be more useful down the road. Like the whole idea of a direct link that you referenced milestones for, creating those direct links and deep linking people into other areas of the application would help us accomplish a more unified experience in GitLab anyways for those personas. So I think that's, I think we can solve this in different ways too without having to go through heuristics. Okay. okay. Well, we have three minutes left. Let me give you a little bit of a preview for what we'll talk about in our next Think Big session. Hi and I are working through our user stories around environments, and I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot about how much customers want to connect deployments to environments. I'm learning a lot about how much customers are doing in Jenkins for pipeline deployments and for their pipeline management and environment deployments and how they're looking to organize and see that information in the environment's view. Um, I also have validated with customers 
that our environment's dashboard today is unusable because it only allows you to see, um, I think it's three environments across seven projects or the other way around. It has such a limited subset. So we do have on our, on our um, build board right now, a schedule for pagination, expanding the amount of environments you can at least see on the environments dashboard. And then that will help customers at least inch toward this management at scale. But we will need to redesign how the environments dashboard works. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have this idea on here about um, a heat map and adding just a graphic that's static of all the environments that somebody has in their group. And it would be green, red, and gray, or whatever kind of gradient makes sense to show like what's live and active, what's been stopped, or what's um, you know inactive or not, not doesn't have a deployment to it. Um, so it's like a no deployment, which would be the gray. And just visualizing that for our users would help them manage their day to day. And then like right below that would have all the current tiles that you see in the environments dashboard. Um, the kinds of things that people are seeing today and managing their environments are these two images that I dropped here. People, um, this is from Jenkins. They have their, they have a matrix and they have the environment name on the left-hand column. And then they have columns for the different builds that are running that, um, that are running on that environment. And the other item that we'll preview that I'm previewing, we can talk more about it in our next thing big. It's this idea of calendar view of deployments. We got hammered hard in the CDRA wave on having a legacy support, um, being able to visualize and see when you have an active deploy freeze, when you have um, a deployment set or scheduled, and being able to visualize um, the release tag dates per milestones in connection to active environments um, is something that a bunch of other companies are doing. So I just copy pasted several different visualizations that other companies are doing that are competitors um, that we're trying to chip away at, but that's kind of the, the high level overview. Quick question. Yeah. Okay, uh, and um, uh, these calendars that you attached here as examples are, because some of those are release calendars, uh, like, and you're talking about the, like, um, for example, if looking at digital AI or formerly Xevia Labs, um, that's a, like a release calendar over there, and I'm it not necessarily the environments, and I'm curious, like, we probably do differentiate those two. Like, what's the goal here to really show the status of the environments and the months of them spin up? or really like, hey, what was released on what day, it kind of. Ah, I think since we view deployments from the environments, we would want to see like, you know, um, activity related to that. Uh, given that our customers are snapshotting deployments with releases, people may want to still have that context awareness. Um, but we use a bunch of upstream features like milestone views um, to give us the calendar view today. So there just might be some opportunity we have to leverage that from like a release planning standpoint. Um, but this is more like if you have an active deploy freeze in your group, um, being aware that that deploy freeze is there so you're not scheduling a, a, a deployment. I see. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so. it, 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 in fact, I guess there's kind of also both, right? Because like there's like well, well what I've got running now, and that's the environments dashboard, whatever that looks like. And then somewhere in between is this calendar of the deploy freezes, but also when did we deploy? That that could be quite interesting as well. Yeah. Totally. Sounds yeah. like it's coming up as an interesting discussion next time. Uh, thanks for a heads up, Jackie. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, Hyana, I just copy pasted something in the middle of your. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's it. Thank you for joining us. Think big. I'll uh, post this to our channels. This is a really good topic. Thank you. Thank you.